Hey everyone, and welcome back to Contract Revolution. My guest on the show today is Marcus Sheridan. Marcus is a globally sought after speaker and consultant. He's the founder of Impact, a digital sales and marketing training company. He's the author of They Ask, You Answer, and The Visual Sale. And he's a partner in River Pools, a Virginia-based fiberglass pool business. He helped save and grow through the 2008 recession and then become one of the most successful pool franchises in the U.S. Marcus is the go-to guy when it comes to content marketing and inbound sales, especially for contractors and home services. And his philosophy is simple but powerful. If your customers are asking about it, you should be creating content about it. Getting out in front of the concerns and questions of your potential buyers is the easiest way to build authority and elevate your company from one in a sea of options to the only one they want to do business with. So on today's episode, expect to learn how to build trust and transparency through your website's content using the Big Five framework, turning visitors into buyers and exponentially increasing site traffic. We talk about just how educated the modern buyer truly is and why relying on uninformed clients is no longer a viable marketing and sales strategy, if it ever was. And lastly, I get Marcus's insights on how to navigate through a changing market, having carefully steered river pools through the 08 financial crisis himself. Making great content doesn't have to be hard. You just have to know where to start. If you're watching this on YouTube and you're not yet subscribed to our channel, click the button below to do that right now. And without further ado, let's dive in with Marcus Sheridan. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Marcus Sheridan, welcome to Contract Revolution. I'm really excited to, to have you today, man. How's it going? Benji, it's going to be a good day, buddy. I got a strong feeling about this one. That's good. That's good. I got a strong feeling about you as a guest, too. I... Um, I've been wanting to get you on for a while, and I think I'll actually start by just having you tell a bit about your story from the beginning. We're going to get into They Ask You Answer and and some of the stuff you're doing at Impact and, and, and all this stuff, but I think our listeners would actually really benefit by knowing a little bit about how you came to be where you are, uh, because the journey was you know somewhat non-linear and very interesting and very relatable for our audience. So maybe just just tell us the Marcus Sheridan story, if you will. Yeah, so when I got out of uh, uh, college right around 2001, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do career-wise. And my two buddies had just started a pool company. And they said to me, hey, did you want to come work in this little retail store that we just started uh, while we're installing swimming pools out in the field? And I said, yeah, sure, until I figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And then they ended up inviting me to be a partner about six months later. And uh, we fought to grow the business, you know, as we tend to do with businesses. And come 2008, 2009, the market crashes. And pool companies all over the U.S. were going out of business. Really, really bad time to own a swimming pool company. But as you know, Benji, there comes uh, with, with, with great pain. Oftentimes, oftentimes comes great innovation because we do things that we have known for a long time that we should have been doing, but now we've got the impetus to do it, right? And so it was during this time that I started to really read about uh, the internet. And it was the first time I saw phrases like inbound marketing, content marketing, social media. And when I heard my simple pool guy mind was, you know, Marcus, if you just obsess over your customers' questions, worries, fears, issues, concerns, and you're willing to address them on your website through text, through video, you just might save your business. So I can recall one night I sat there at my kitchen table and I just brainstormed like every single question I had heard over the years that people were asking about swimming pools and fiberglass swimming pools. And then over the next two years, I answered those questions through text, through video, on my website, website almost one a day, every day, for the next couple of years. And we would quickly become the most traffic swimming pool website in the world. We became like the Wikipedia of pools. And I started writing about the success we were having. And uh, I called this, this uh, framework, this philosophy, they ask, you answer. 
which is this obsession, the questions and the worries and the fears of the buyers. And so as I was writing about this, companies started to say, hey, man, can you teach me how to do that? And then others would say, can you share this like story, your pool guy story at our event? And so quickly before I knew it, I started to speak. And once I got a few stages, I got a lot of stages. And that's been my full-time full time job for the last 10 years. River Pools would go on to become a massive company, a manufacturer of fiberglass pools, a f- the first franchise of fiberglass pools in the U.S. And in 2021, I sold the manufacturing and the franchising side. I still own the original River Pools, so it's still a pretty good business. The book came out in 2017, They Ask You Answer, and uh, that led to a very successful agency that helps companies now all over the world apply They Ask You Answer to their business. So it's a fun time, Benji. It's been a great ride, you know, and it reminds me a lot of, I'll just say this one more thing before I finish the story. You know, in 2000 and, uh, in 2010, 11, I had never made more than $100,000 a year. And my business was still trying to recover and it was a lot of pain. And by 2021, I became a millionaire. And what's interesting, I couldn't stop thinking about that quote. That is, we oftentimes overestimate what we can do in a year and underestimate what we can do in 10. So my life completely changed in 10 years, and it really has been an amazing ride. I um, I love that comment about... Uh about patience. It's, it's been my experience too. Just every, like the, t- the 12 month business cycle isn't as long as you think, but a decade's a lot longer than you think. And there's also, you know, yeah. compounding returns in there when you, when you, so what's really interesting about your story is I read about you in this really great book called Epic Content Marketing by Joe Pulitzi, which we read sort of as a um, a framework before launching into our podcast and the content brand that we're trying to build. And, you know, this is, you know, probably a dated book by now, but it's, I still think it's so relevant. Some of the stuff it teaches and talks about, and you were featured really heavily in it. And we were like, man, this guy is a pool company. And he's got like, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of you, you know, site visits just by writing articles about, you know, these super like niche, random technical questions about the installation of a pool or how to service it. Yeah. And um, so this feels like this feels like kind of a, f- a full circle moment getting to talk to you. Wh- you. When you go when you think back to that period of um, of figuring out this, they ask you answer framework. Do you kind of credit the the 08 downturn and, and some of the suffering on a business level that you guys went through as what almost forced you to find this? 100 percent. And that's why I said with with that pain comes the innovation. That's why, too, Benji, when we look at what's happening right now at the marketplace, I would expect the next couple of years we'll see more innovation than we've seen in the last 10, simply because companies are going to be forced to innovate. That's just what happens when we're under strain, when we're under stress. And speaking of um, of epic content marketing, Joe just came out with the revised version of it. And so it's... Uh, up to date. It's brand new. Lots of new case studies. I'm still in there, but there's a lot of other <laughs> new case studies. And so um, if you're listening to this, I would recommend his books. Very, very good one, like you said. One of the things you talk about um, in the early parts of the book is this concept that there are blurring lines between sales and marketing. And that is something that I personally sort of feel on an intuitive level, but I'm not yet able to really succinctly describe what's going on there. I kind of know it to be true, but maybe you could help fill the gaps. Like what, what do you mean when you make that statement? So bottom line is our buyer is more informed than they've ever been. When we research, when we buy, we're more informed than we've ever been. Studies have shown that the typical buyer is roughly 70 to 80% through that buyer's journey before they reach out to a company. So before they fill out that form on their website, before they call them, they are on average 70 to 80% through that journey. So they're vetting us to death before they reach out. And so what does this mean? Well, it's very interesting because if being honest with ourselves, 
And we said, okay, well, what department, therefore, of your organization has a greater impact on the actual sale? Is it the sales department or the marketing department? Which one? Well, it's the marketing department because they're handling so much of the buyer's journey. And oh, by the way, it's not a sales journey or a sales process. It's a buyer's yes. journey, folks, because they own it. They are in charge. We're not in charge anymore. They're really dictating the terms more than ever. They have the ability to do that. And so once you accept that, you're like, okay, so marketing is handling more of the sales process than they ever have, certainly more than your sales team is handling. So what does that mean too for sales and marketing? Well, it means marketing's got to be responsible for revenue today. You've got to see them as a revenue producer and they're not an expense, they're revenue. At the same time, sales has to be seen as one that also participates in marketing initiatives. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have a salesperson on your staff and your marketing person or team says, I'd like to produce some educational videos that we can answer some of the most common questions that we get from homeowners. Well, that salesperson, if he or she says, no, that ain't my job. I'm going to go in the home. I'm going to sell. You make the videos. Uh, not getting it. Because that salesperson, it is their obligation to now be the subject matter expert during that 80% because they're the ones too, the salesperson, that has their ears on the ground. That's That really knows and hears the marketplace, what they're asking, what they're searching, what they're fearing, what they're frustrated with, the doubts, the worries, the concerns. It's their job to bring those to marketing and to be the subject matter expert. It's not marketing's job to be the dang subject matter expert. This is also why, though, some of the greatest case studies I've ever seen when it comes to dominating online, the, the owner of the business saw his or her primary responsibility as the head of marketing, or at least the, the key subject matter expert. So he or she was completely engaged with the camera, very, very like willing to be on camera, willing to help participate, create that content. Wasn't necessarily writing the articles, wasn't editing the videos, but was very engaged in the process. How has the, um, you say like the eight, 70 to 80% of the, 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 the buyer's journey is sort of complete by the time they make contact. Was this not like, was this not the case before? Like I, so I have, have a sense that the internet has changed this by uh, consumer preferences has changed this. I don't think in 2003, 70% of the buyer's journey was done when they made contact. Something has shifted over the last little while. Yeah, if so, this has really been a 25 year game here for the most part, roughly 25 ish years, because it was right around 97, 98 that the internet started to take off. The first search engines really started to get used mainstream, and the rest, as they say, Benji, is, is history. But during that time, you and I, and everybody listening to this right now, we've become very skilled in what is the school of search. We've learned things. We've learned, for example, that the more spe specific we are with the words that we use when we search, the more specific the results. Nobody taught you that. Nobody, right. nobody said, hey, Benji, this is how you use Google. No, you actually learned through this process of vetting, researching, testing, prompting online. The same thing is now going to happen with ChatGPT and all things that are AI. It's a, we're going to go through the exact same totally. process, but it's going to just happen faster than it happened in 1996, 7, 8, right? And so because we have all the information now at our fingertips, what that means is our patience is less, our expectations are greater. Our intolerance as well has grown for companies that are not willing to give us what we want. Right. that are not willing to talk about those fundamental questions, worries, fears, issues, concerns that we have during the buying process. How would you, do you think that the role of the salesperson then has changed too? And if so, what was it before and what is it now? Well, I think oftentimes the salesperson before was the primary teacher. Right. That is no longer 
the case. At least it should not be the case. At least after you've shook hands with said salesperson. Now, if that salesperson is the primary teacher while they're vetting you online, great. But not once you've shaken hands. That's a problem if that's what you're dealing with right now. So I think the salesperson of today, and this is why we have great books like, let's say, Challenger Sale, mm-hmm. right? Because what they need to be is a trusted advisor, right? That's the idea. The trusted advisor doesn't just, you know, roll over. They're a subject matter expert. Now, what's interesting, though, is if I talk to a group of people, if I'm with an audience, and I say, how many of you have recently gone through the buying process and you met with a salesperson where you could tell right away that you knew more than the salesperson knew right. about the thing they were selling? Everybody in the room raises their hand. It happens all the time. And that's because we got so dang much information at our fingertips. Now, this elevates the standards, the bar for the great salespeople today because you still got to be a great subject matter expert, but you also have to have the skills to be a trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. You got to know when to push back. You got to know how to ask the right questions. And the sad reality of it, most of those fundamental soft skills of selling and our personal skills, they're a lost art, man. Mm-hmm. Most of these companies these days, they're, they're so focused on pipelines and have you put the data in the CRM that they're not even doing role plays anymore and teaching you how to ask the right discovery questions, causing core problems with salespeople around the world. I know that's a whole other podcast, by the way. But point being is the bar has raised. I've noticed the same thing with us too as you know we've been we've been producing releasing distributing content for about over 2 years now and the level of so first of all it's been unbelievable for our brand trust our reach our Q, like, like the the qualified leads we generate all that stuff is up but it's also created a situation where our sales team needs to be more on it than they were before <laughs> because because buyers, potential buyers, are coming in not with generic high-level questions about tell me about your product and blah, 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 but because they've consumed the content, they come in and they're like, I have this very specific problem with my onboarding process for field staff. I wanted to talk to you about that for like half an hour. So it means that I know I know exactly what you're talking about because I've observed it with our marketing and sales teams where it's like, Yes, these people are more trusting and we have more of them to work with. And the sale in some ways is easier, but in other ways it's more challenging because you need to have technical prowess. You need to, you need to be that advisor, as you say. And I just think that's, so I'm, I'm absolutely a proponent of this because I've seen what it's done for our company, but it is interesting to pay attention to the shifts it creates. It does create shifts. I mean, I've had situations, I'm not going to lie, where somebody was talking to one of my salespeople and they said, to the salesperson, oh, yeah, I'm hearing you, but, you know, I was watching Marcus, and Marcus said such and such, and so it sounds like, you know, you're all not on the same page. (laughs) That gets really slippery there, bro, right, because they're vetting us. And I'll say this. When it comes to sales today, it is our job as great salespeople today to help the prospect feel like they have heard our voice and seen our face, and therefore know us before we've ever met them. And if the moment they see you and shake your hand, if that's the first time they've seen your face and heard your voice, you as a sales professional have failed that prospect. That is inexcusable in 2023. That should never be the case. You talk about this thing, maybe this is a good segue, you talk about something you call the ostrich marketing strategy in the book, and that's just kind of a hooky visual. What, what's the ostrich marketing strategy? Yeah, right. The myth is the ostrich, when it has a problem, it buries its head in the ground, right? But it is a great visual because what businesses do is when we get questions that we don't want to address, we bury our heads in the ground too, right? So if you look at really what they ask you, answer is, It is the ultimate framework becoming the most trusted voice in your space. That's what we'll help you do. But if you want to become the most trusted voice, you got to be willing to do three things. 
You got to be willing to talk about what others in your space are not willing to talk about. You got to be willing to show through video what others in your space aren't willing to show. And you got to be willing to sell in a way that others in your space aren't willing to sell. So I would ask you, if you're listening to this right now, can you honestly say that we are, as a business, talking about showing and selling in a way that at least 95% of our competitors are not consistently doing right now? Now, if I was in a room of 100 people, one person might raise their hand that could say, yes, I'm doing that. Now, you see, those three things, that's the antithesis of the ostrich. The ostrich says, I can't talk about that. If they ask me, sure. I can't talk about pricing. I can't talk about my competitors. I can't talk about reviews. I can't do those things. To heck you can't. Of course you can. You are making the election not to, but you can talk about whatever you want. What you should be debating is how do we talk about this effectively? Because if the prospect has asked you about it, it should be something you're addressing online, period. Don't debate it further than that. Golden rule, folks. Treat them as you yourself would want to be treated. So there's lots of subjects that we research. Mm -hmm. In fact, in the book, we talk about, as you know, Benji, the big five. There's five subjects that buyers are obsessed with whenever they are researching a product, a service, a solution. Here's the five. As buyers and consumers, we're obsessed with how much is it? Cost questions. Problems, what are the negatives with it? Comparisons, how does it compare to that other thing I'm looking at? Reviews, what's everybody saying about it? The good, bad, and the ugly. And finally, best. Best, most, top. How many times have you gone online and searched the best such and such companies, right? So cost, problems, comparisons, reviews, best. These are the big five. And companies don't want to talk about them. And consumers, all they want to do is ask questions about those five subjects. So I, I, uh, we're going to dive into all five of these. Let's, let's, t let's just be super literal for the audience. When we say talk about, what are the yeah. environments that we're saying? Are we talking about website, social media channels, sales collateral and brochures like this is a you know the they ask the you above. answer yep. philosophy is a framework for understanding collecting making and distributing the content that your buyers want but i first want to answer this question where should if we're nowhere on this where should we be thinking what's the real estate that we want to fill these answers with if that makes sense foremost it is on your website It'll be on social too, right? Could be on your YouTube channel, whatever. But fundamentally, it's going to live on your website. And ideally, you get to a place where eventually you have what we call in the book a learning center. A learning center is or a learning hub or a knowledge center. This is that hub of information where they can learn in their own style. So it could be under your learning center, you've got some different categories. You've got educational articles. You've got your video library. You maybe have a podcast like you do, Benji. They're a contractor evolution like just, you know, you might have um, uh, digital brochures. You might have some calculators, some self-service tools, like all these different case studies, right? So that is what's found generally in your learning hub, knowledge hub, learning center, whatever you want to call it, okay? That is where it should live. And then social is also is where you're going to put it out there. But you see, you don't own social media. You don't own your Facebook page. You don't. TikTok could go out of business tomorrow, right. as we're hearing in the news right now. Right. And so that's rented land. You got to have your own property, as Joe Polizzi says, right, mm -hmm. in Epic Content Marketing. And so you would want to have that on your website. That's where you're going to put it. And your collateral, that could be your printed collateral as well. Where does the asking happen? In my, in my experience, a lot of it comes from sales meetings and estimates that you're doing with actual prospects. And then the other place I can think of would be search queries. And you're using, you're using SEO tools to figure out what questions people are asking. Can you maybe backfill anything I'm missing there as far as where the asking from they ask, you ask answer comes from? Well, yeah, this, this comes from a very keen awareness of knowing your customer, knowing how they think, feel, search, right? And so anybody that's worth their salt, I should be able to come to you and say, all right, what's 100 questions that a potential buyer could have about your product, your service, et cetera? When I say your product, your service, I'm talking general questions about the industry, not about your company, mm -hmm. not what are your hours. No, mm -hmm. no, no. It's how much does a fiberglass pool cost? Fiberglass versus concrete pools, which is best? 
You know, that's the type of questions that people are searching. And so those are the ones that you should brainstorm without using any tools at all first. And once you've done that, then you can use some tools. Easiest, cheapest tool is the Google box at google.com. And you just start searching and you let it suggest, right? right? So you might say, you know, um, you know, let's say you're a home contractor and you do a lot of siding. So you might go online and you type in best siding for, and then it's going to show you a bunch of different applications, right? For commercial applications, right? For homes or t- certain types of homes. It's like, you're going to get all these different queries that people are doing. Each one of those is a separate question, separate search that should be addressed on your website through text, through video. So you got to become really, really obsessed with the way, way people think. To give an example of this too, Benji, is like, when I started the Ask You Answer and I was in a home on a, you know, giving a quote to a homeowner, if they would ask me a question in a meeting, I would think to myself, before I even answered, I think to myself, is this answered on my website? Right. And then I would think, why is it not answered on my website? Why are they asking this right now? If it is answered, how come they don't know the answer? Or have I not addressed it? Why have I not addressed it? And so it's like my best keyword tool, okay, in quotes there, was listening to the stinking homeowner and becoming truly obsessed with their thoughts, searches, worries, concerns, the whole nine. Yes, you can use those tools, but that's where you want to start. Yeah, totally. You, I. I, I like what you just said there because I would say getting into maybe the more the the um, the SEO side of this is a little bit more advanced and something you should do. But if you're kind of just on square one, just like have a long page of notes and listen very carefully in your sales meetings because you will probably get those first 100 questions you need to answer from there. No, nothing fancy required about that. I want to talk about talk more about the big five. And the first one you talk about is pricing and cost. And and I'm paraphrasing the chapter, but, you know, your thoughts on this are that you should be incredibly forthright and transparent about what you charge, how you charge, and why. Um, Can you maybe talk about why that's such a fundamental thing? And then also, why? what kind of objections or pushback do you get on that idea from contractors? (laughs) Uh, Okay. So we've got so much data now because of the amount of companies that we worked with. We know the subjects that people search, especially when they're serious about buying. Those big five, they run, let's say, the home improvement space and so many other spaces. I mean, it just goes on and on. But again, cost, problems, comparisons, reviews, and best. Now, let's talk about cost. Can we start with cost? Yeah, yeah. Is that cool with you, Ben? Yeah, yeah. Let's do one at so a time. Let's, let's say no. Yeah, let's 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 analyze the pushback on cost, okay? And I'm going to say this out loud. I'm not, if you're listening to this, I want you to just answer in your head as if you were with me right now. So if I said to you, have you researched how much something costs online in the last year? What would you say? You'd say yes. And if I said, so when you're on a website and you're researching cost and price and you cannot find it, what is the emotion you experience? And you're probably thinking, I get, I get pretty frustrated, okay? So in that moment of frustration, do you as the buyer, do you as the searcher, do you say to yourself... I'm sure it's on this website somewhere. I'm just going to keep on looking until I find it. <laughs> That's laughable. You don't do that, right? Next. If I said to you, if I said to you, okay, in that moment of frustration, do you as the buyer, do you as the searcher, do you say to yourself, and this is important, everyone, listen, do you say to yourself, well, that's okay. They're not talking about cost and price and give me what I want. They're a value-based business. I'm going to call them on the phone instead. <laughs> now, everybody's laughing, saying, ain't no way I do that because you as the buyer, you as the searcher, you keep doing what? That's right. You keep searching and you search until what happens. You find it elsewhere. You find what you were looking for. That's Mm -hmm. right. And generally speaking, whoever whoever gives you what you were looking for, they're going to get what? They're going to get your business. If not your business, they're going to get first contact, first phone call. And that's the case with all of us. Now, you say to yourself, well, that might be true for me, Marcus, but you see, you don't understand my business. Yeah, I do understand your business. It's built on trust, just like mine. So let's analyze it further. There's three reasons why we don't like to talk about cost and price on a website. First reason, we say every job is different. It's a customized solution, yada, yada, yada. Okay, so if I said to you, can you help me understand the factors that would drive the cost of your service up? Could you answer that? Yes or no? Answer is yes. If I came to you, I said, can you help me understand the factors that would keep the cost of that product or service years down? Could you explain that? Yes. 
If I came to you and I said, can you help me understand why some contractors are so expensive? Mm -hmm. Yes. If I came to you and I said, can you help me understand why some contractors are so cheap? Could you explain that? Yes. And so you see, the whole idea of it depends is the easiest to address on your website right. by explaining what drives costs up, what drives costs down, why are some companies so expensive, why are some companies so cheap? That should be addressed by every single contractor in the freaking world because this is how you define value in the marketplace, folks. And if you don't define it, people won't know. So that's how it works. And then you can talk about you. But that's what a pricing page looks like, by the way. Explaining those five things, what drives costs up, what drives costs down, why some companies are expensive, why some companies are cheap, and roughly where do you fall. So okay. for so what, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. All right. So that's it depends. Second reason why we don't talk about cost and price is we say, my competitors will find out. That's really dumb because if I said to anybody that's listening to this that's worth their salt, do you have a pretty good sense as to what your competitors charge already? You'd say, yeah, you might not know the exact, but you have a good sense. And so if you know what they charge, it therefore means, that's right, if they know what you charge, this is the big secret, non-secret. Everybody acts like nobody knows what everybody's charging, when in reality, everybody's got a pretty good sense as to what everybody else is charging. And besides that, when was the last time your competitors paid your bills? That's the second reason why we don't talk about cost of price. So the first one was it depends, which is easy to explain and teach. Second one is I don't want my competitors to find out. And the third one, Benji, is, well, we tend to be more expensive. And if they mm. see we're more expensive, we just might scare them away. What's funny about that is what we all just agreed a second ago, the thing that actually scares us away during the buying process isn't when the company is teaching us and explaining value, but rather when they ignore it, when they don't talk about it. That's what scares us away. Ignorance is not bliss online. And so when we embraced the Ask You Answer, our first piece of content we put on our website was, how much does a fiberglass pool cost? And to this day, Benji, if you research anything about how much a fiberglass pool costs, we're probably going to be the first ones you see. And what's really, really cool, I've got some updated numbers for you, that one single article about how much does a fiberglass pool cost that nobody was willing to write. <laughs> By the way, I didn't say exactly how much a fiberglass pool costs because you can't, right? But I could talk about all the factors. That one single article, because we have advanced analytics, has generated over $25 million in sales. Since the day wow. we wrote it. Now, $25 million for a 45-minute article that I wrote in my kitchen table one night. You want to talk about ROI? That's a freaking ROI there, brother. I love that. And I think the part, the, the objection that really resonates with me the most that I, I just want to touch on is the it depends answer. Most of our listeners will have, you know, there'd be some... Um, Exterior maintenance, some window cleaning businesses, some landscape maintenance businesses, what we would consider smaller average job size companies where you're able to, you actually are able to put a dollar amount and it, it might be sort of a simplified version where it's like, hey, a, a small house usually costs this much, a medium house costs this much, and a big house costs that much. I'm using sort of a window cleaning example. You might be able to do that. But for a lot of our a lot of our contractors and a lot of our listeners, they're building custom homes, they're doing massive landscape installs, they're doing commercial paint jobs. So it isn't reasonable to give a price right on the website. But what you're saying is you rather than like trying to be myopic about putting a dollar figure there, you talk about pricing and the why and the how yeah. behind pricing. Like that's the content. That's what you're talking about at length in explaining what drives cost up, what drives cost down all that stuff. And I just think that's a, yeah. that's a way easier way to approach it. We're not saying guys, you need to put, you know, this exact dollar figure on the homepage of your website, but you should talk at length about how pricing works. Let me give you some ex other examples of what you can do. Pretty much every industry works in a tiered effect, right? So let's take landscaping, for example, right? So if you look at the landscaping industry, there's essentially three, three and a half tiers of landscapers. There's what would be low, middle, high end, and ultra high end, okay? And so if you talk to most contractors and you say, roughly, is there a range that most of your jobs fall in? They'll say yes. For example, for me as a pool guy, most of my jobs fall in the eighty dollars to $150,000 range. Yeah. Most of our pools are in that range. So that means we're pricing-wise pricing middle of the road. We're not low end. All right, which would be sub 75K. All right, what we are is middle. Then you've got the 150 to 500,000 high end, and then you've got a half a million and above, ultra high end. All right, that's how it works in most industries. Most people don't even understand that. 
what I just described to you is the type of thing, Benji, that would be on a pricing page. Mm -hmm. Literally teaching them, okay, so as you get involved and you're starting to research in the landscaping space, first you have to understand there's different tiers of what you could expect from different types of contractors. Then you explain that. And here's what each one of these different tiers would likely specialize right. in. Here's what a type of project would look like for them. So now all of a sudden the person's like saying, oh, okay, I got it. Because we assume that everybody just knows what it's like to work with a landscaper. They don't. Freak. Some people call themselves a landscaper and all they're doing is mowing lawns. Right. Right. And the next person is doing, you know, you know, a million dollar, you know, like, you know, water features in their backyard. It's like, this is how it works. Totally. Um. Should we talk about we, uh, turning weaknesses into strengths? This is point number well, two can, of the big yeah, five. We can, yeah, yeah. So, so the second of the big five is problems, i.e., negatives, i.e., fears, anything like that. And to help you understand this, one of the questions we should always get were questions like, "So, Marcus, what are the problems of fiberglass pools? Are fiberglass pools ugly? Do fiberglass pools crack?" Do fiberglass pools pop out of the ground, right? Do fiberglass pools look like a bathtub? So these are questions that people would ask that are perceived negatives. Most companies don't want to answer them, don't want to address them because they don't even want to give any attention to this negative question. I'm thinking to myself, no, 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 y'all, because guess what? If somebody is asking the question, do fiberglass pools pop out of the ground, guess what? They're thinking about buying a fiberglass pool. <laughs> That's the only reason. They're going to buy, like, they're going to ask that question is if they're thinking about buying right, it. Right. And so those are the ones that you want to own because now you can flip it on their head. We wrote an article, um, top five fiberglass pools, problems, and solutions. So top five fiberglass pool problems and solutions. We talked about different problems with fiberglass pools, all right, and their limitations, who they wouldn't be a good fit for. And we talked about some ways to address those, but we said, you know, they're not for everybody, and here's why. But here's what's crazy about it. The phrase fiberglass pool problems, that phrase alone for people searching it has made my little company in Warsaw, Virginia, over a million dollars in revenue. Wow. That one phrase, these are people searching problems, negatives, the elephant in the room. That's how you take what is a perceived negative and turn it into a strength. It's freaking powerful. So, for example, if you're doing a particular type of sighting that people complain about, right? Or if you're like, what are the drawbacks to, you know, a particular type of uh, paver stone? That's the type of thing that you should be really leaning into, right? Instead of not talking about it, you want to lean into it. Somebody says, is stamped concrete slippery? You should be talking about that on your website because it is slippery unless you do certain things. And it's still going to be a little more slippery because it's sealed versus, say, brush concrete. Right. And then there's a bunch of other options. But the point is you're leaning into all of them. Now, most people would say like, well, Marcus, I don't I don't want to talk about my product or service in that light. But you're making the case that, look, your, your buyer is going to figure that out whether you address it or not. So you might as well control the conversation. Is, is that kind of the idea? 100%. You can either be proactive or you can be reactive, right? The greatest way in life to resolve a concern is to address it before it becomes a concern. So somebody says to you, well, I heard such and such. Now you're on the reactive. Right. Whereas if you were the one that had brought that up, you're controlling the conversation. But to your point, Benji, what's happening is people still believe it's 1995 and buyers are dumb, that they're uninformed, and that the salesperson is going to be doing all the teaching. That's not how it works anymore. It will never go back to that. And so if we treat them as informed, intelligent human beings, our ability to earn trust and stand out from our competitors is prolifically high. Right. Right. I remember I remember a time selling home services unsuccessfully where you, you'd get in an estimate or you'd be meeting with the prospect where on some level there's a part of your brain that's hoping they don't have certain information. <laughs> Like, I'm embarrassed to yes. admit that. You're just like, ah, you know, because I don't really want to talk about it. I hope I can just skate around this conversation. I don't, I just don't, you know, I may have gotten away with that in 2011. I don't think that's happening on any level anymore. They know. No, the fr here's the phrase. 
consumer ignorance is no longer a viable sales and marketing strategy. Right. That's so well said. That's so well said. So what about what about these? What about verses and comparisons? Uh, that's well, point number you know, three. When, when somebody, you know, in our in the contractor space, this is prolific. People are constantly saying this versus this, pros and cons of this versus that. Right? I mean, it just goes down the list. And so, once again, you can ignore it, or you can lean into it. The key, though, listen to me, folks. The key is that you don't sit there and schlep your product. So if I'm going to write an article or produce a video, fiberglass versus concrete pools, which was a question I would get all the time, I'm not going to sit there and say, hey, now, you don't want a concrete pool. You don't want the maintenance that comes with that. I mean, you don't want all that study chemicals. You don't want that. You want a fiberglass. That's stupid. I can't talk like that, right? How do I got to talk? I got to sound unbiased. I got to be very disarming. So the way I would say that is something like this, Benji. You know, one of the questions we get here all the time at River Pools is, okay, Marcus, be honest. Tell me, why should I choose a fiberglass pool over concrete? The truth is, you shouldn't necessarily choose a fiberglass pool over concrete. In fact, there are times when concrete is the better option. So what this video or what this article is going to do, it's going to explain to you honestly and transparently the pros and the cons of both types of swimming pools. And then by the end, hopefully you'll have a great sense as to which is the best choice for you. You see, how many brands speak to you like that online? Almost none, but that's what you want, Benji, because that person's treating you as an intelligent human being that's saying, listen, I'm going to present to you the facts, now you decide. That's what we want as buyers, and that's what engender, it engenders the trust. What kind of response does that unbiasedness elicit from prospects or leads or sales meetings? You know, I get stuff like, you know, people come to me all the time and they'll say stuff like this, Benji. I just feel like everything I learned, I learned from you guys. How many times have you heard that? If you're listening to this right now, how many times have, has a homeowner said, I feel like everything I've learned through this process, I learned from you. If you're not hearing it consistently, there's a reason for that because you're not understanding the way the buyer has changed. You're not taking the time to educate them on the front end. You're not producing the articles or the videos or whatever the thing is. You can do this. Everybody, you've got more subject matter expertise in your brain than 99.9% of the world about that thing that you do. Right. Now you just got to transfer it. And it's never been easier to transfer it in the history of the world than it is right now. Um, so they appreciate it. There, there, there's goodwill that's being created. There's trust that's being created. By talking 100%. about other options, you're not actually selling a competitor. You're at worst, at the very worst, you're offboarding a like the, incor the incorrect client or someone that just wasn't going to be your buyer in the first place. You're not actually like yeah. pushing revenue away. You're just kind of doing right by them and, and by extension doing right by your own business. Yeah, this is why whenever you're presenting anything that you sell, you want to try and show both sides of the coin because that's the disarming element. When we say disarming, think of it like this. When somebody asks you a question in the sales process, like, why should I go with you guys over such and such? Why should I choose your product over such and such? They're actually expecting you to be biased. Right. And so the key to disarming is to get them to immediately let go of that defensive posture. It goes back to the hostage negotiator and the the bad guy so the bad guy trying to negotiate with the host the hostage negotiator right first thing the negotiator says is drop your weapons put your weapons down let's talk about this why does he or she say that because you can't have a conversation that's rooted in trust if somebody's pointing a weapon at you and so you might say that's an extreme example no the psychology is the same somebody asks you okay marcus be honest tell me why should i choose fiberglass over concrete and they're folding their arms to lean it back they're expecting you to be honest you come around and say you know what i'm not sure you should benji right. in fact let's talk about when you would and when you wouldn't immediately they're like okay wait you're leaning in you're like okay something's going on here this guy's different not like everybody else that i've talked to mm -hmm. we have this tendency in the home improvement contractor space etc to be so freaking biased right. with our stuff and we turn people off bad but what's powerful is the moment you're willing to say what you're not who you're not a good fit for is the moment you become dramatically more attractive to those who you are a good fit for 
Yeah, I'd love to learn more about why that is. There's some reverse psychology at play. It, you know, it's like that example of like, well, tell me why we should do this or work with you or buy your product. And your answer is like, well, you know, to, to be honest, you, you may not, maybe you shouldn't. And like, let, let's talk about in a more expanded way, the parameters that we would look at to decide whether it is or it isn't. And um, I've certainly felt that in, in my own selling in person. And then I've also, and then when you kind of do that at scale through content, the same thing happens. Um, let's, let's hit reviews and best in class too and round out the big five. I have a couple other questions I wanted to ask you about selling, some stuff you brought up earlier, but uh, reviews and best in class, where do they fit into this overall framework? So uh, reviews and best are very similar. Oftentimes we'll time together. So for example, I used to get asked, and this is one that's really ballsy. Anybody that's listening to this should do this, but you probably won't because you're going to say, wow, that's gutsy. I don't know if I could do that. I used to get asked the question all the time back in the day, stuff like, you know, Marcus, we like you. We think we want to do business with you and your pool company, but if we don't do business with you, is there anybody else you might recommend? And so I remember I got that question when I was still selling pools way back in the day. This is over 10 years ago, and I was, I think it was in Richmond, Virginia. Man, with this couple of two and a half hours, Marcus, we like you. We think we want to get this bull from you. But if we don't get this bull from you, is there anybody else you really recommend? I thought to myself, okay, that going it, they asked the question. They didn't buy the pool that night, but they asked the question, which means I'm going to answer it. They asked you answer. So I went home that night and I wrote an article. Um, who are the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia? Reviews slash ratings. Okay. Who are the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia? Reviews slash ratings. And I came to a list of five of the best pool builders in Richmond, Virginia. Now, I didn't even put myself on that list. And you're like, dude, you didn't put yourself on that list. Why not? Because if I create a best of list and then I put myself on said list, I'm going to lose credibility. So I didn't put myself on the list. Man, that seems so illogical. Well, if they're reading the article, where are they? They're on my website. I'm already winning. And plus, if you read the article, you're going to immediately, like, and I, all you have to do right now, if your computer listening to this, just type in best pool builders, Richmond, Virginia. You're going to see the article. It's going to pop up on the first couple search results. And... What's so crazy about that is that article has been a cash cow. You know, let me give an example. I listed uh, my competitors on there, of course. And so today, if you go on, one of them was called Play More Pools, okay? And so if you go online today and you research reviews, Play More Pools, Richmond, Virginia, what do you see? That article. Right. That article, which is why when people are researching my competitors today, oftentimes they're going to learn about my competitors from me on right. my website. That's friggin' bad A right there, brother. And that happens because I get asked the question. I'm not going to shy away from it, but here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to say anything negative about the competition. I'm going to literally, if I'm going to make a statement about them, it's going to be something they would say themselves about themselves. You know, they're from this area. They specialize in this area. They've been in the business this long. Okay. Whatever that thing is, that's what I'm going to say about them. All right. And that's how you want to approach it with your, um, with your, um, with, uh, with your competition. Now, again, the key to any review and any best is you got to be willing to say both sides. If you do a good review of, let's say, a type of, let's say you're going to do a review on uh, travertine decking, okay? If you're going to do a review on travertine, you got to talk about what are the pros and what are the cons. So a potential con would be, you know what, travertine is absolutely beautiful, but it is more expensive than your typical paver. And so... If you're thinking, I really want some type of block paver patio, but I want to stay on, on, on the lower end of cost, well, then travertine's probably not the best fit for you. Right. So that's a, that's a classic example of seeing it in such a way that you're not saying you're cheap. If you're cheap, go with, you know, regular paver patio. Like, no, you're saying, hey, listen, if, you're, if you want a paver patio, something that's blocky, but you don't want to spend top dollar, travertine's probably not the best fit for you. People appreciate the heck out of that. Right. Do, do people think like when they listen or, or read um, your work, do they like the idea of talking about competitors, not in a negative light, in a neutral or even at times maybe positive light, do they think you're nuts? Yes. Yes. I get it all the time. I mean, to this, I was the first person that I'm aware of in the industry that was very aggressively and openly talking about competitors. I was giving awards out to different competitors, best in class awards. I mean, I was doing all types of stuff because the only thing I wanted to make sure of is that when they were learning about the thing, they were learning from me. That's all I cared about. And I knew everything would fall into place after that. 
I think is while you're playing into something, uh, something to do with abundance mindset or ab- you're like, word, you're like, absolutely, brother. you're like saying, you're like, I'm so confident in us and what we do in our brand that I have no problem talking about like for like we, you know, I had another, we had another, you know, business coach consultant person on the podcast a couple weeks ago. We do this all the time. I'm like, I don't know, like they have good stuff too. I have zero fear because I know that what we do and, and I know the strength of the brand and the trust we have. I have no fears or no qualms about uh, sharing the the platform a little bit with people who, you know, you could deem as a competitor. And I think, first of all, there's just like a sort of an ethical part of it where I think that's the right thing to do, especially if there's something great to say. But if I'm being selfishly a marketer, I also think you're kind of purveying a level of like, yeah, I'm not worried about it. Like we're that good. Um, and I think, yes, I think customers yes. pick up on that on some level. They totally can tell. They feel like you're the expert, like you're yeah. the trusted voice because you address the elephant in the room. You went at the thing that nobody else is willing to go after. And you're right. It is gutsy. It is ballsy. And a lot of people won't do it. And that's why we have high performers. And then the other 95% are just like, wow, that's a pretty cool idea. I can't believe it did that, but they won't do it. Like yeah. literally, of the people that are listening to this right now, you know, uh, 5% will buy the book they ask you answer. And then of the people that read read it, read it, another 5% will actually do it to any serious degree. This is, to me, what's so great about life is because I always know that the very, very high majority are going to hear the idea, say, wow, yeah. that's wild, and they're going to do nothing about it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I um, Okay. So all this stuff, like, obviously takes some work. Answer this question for me. For a business who is currently relying on customer ignorance too much, maybe not entirely, <laughs> but there's an awareness that they're listening to this and they're going, yeah, you know what? I, he's right. So for a business who is, let's say, has limited resources, one, two million dollars a year, not going to be able to afford to build out a content team or go like what sort of the what's the cheap and cheerful version of the implementation plan for that business? And then maybe you can tack on a more well-resourced approach to it for a more advanced business who has a larger budget and can deploy human resources toward it. Yeah, if if I if I was a much smaller shop and you know I had to produce the content myself, I would just be doing a lot of video because the video video today is is the quickest way for you to show and tell a story without spending almost any money at all. And this is especially true with short form vertical style video, call it YouTube Shorts, Facebook Reels, Instagram Reels, um, and uh, TikTok as well. So those style, like every single job you ever do from this point forward should have a before, during, and after video that is produced that shows the change in the process. And that can be edited together by your 16-year-old daughter, and bam, (laughs) you've got a YouTube short that's going to potentially just go nuts. And those work very, very well. They're very effective. Now, there's a lot of other videos that you should be producing. You can read about them in the book. The shorts aren't the only one. But that's where you that's where you want to start. Also, because of chat, GPT, and AI today, there's so many questions that you can get answered. You just need to make sure you add your personal human voice to those. That's important. And so you want to, you know, if you're going to go and you're going to say, you know, okay, chat, GPT, you know, what are the five you know, best, you know, uh, types of sightings for homes in 2023 or whatever you do. Okay. If you're going to do that, that's fine. And it's going to make the list for you, but you need to personalize it. You need to add some story to it of your experiences. You need to come from a, a first person perspective. You know, one of the questions we get asked here all the time at such and such contracting is, okay, what are some of the best sightings for residential homes in 2023. And so that's what this article is all about, right? So it's got to be very personal, very that style. But ChatGPT is going to change your life if you if you get into the sandbox a little bit of what it can do. So I would recommend that you would do that and that you use that. Um, that's where you start. Now, once you scale up, you're going to get a full-time videographer eventually. That's going to change your world. If you get a full-time videographer, you read about that in the book and potentially a full-time content writer, content manager as well. Cool. Cool. Start with the easy stuff, uh, simple short form videos, and then you can kind of level up to an intermediate or, or advanced level later on. Um, 
you, you know, you're preaching to the choir on the vertical shorts front. We just did some pretty big upgrades to our short form content recently, and it's sort of, or it's performing orders of magnitude better than it was two months ago. Like it's, it's it's a pretty Crazy. overnight improvement. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's not yeah. no work. It takes some hours in editing and some clever cuts, but it, it's it's not a crazy crazy amount of work to get reach that you know, a year or two ago, we didn't think was possible. Okay. I want to just like, there's a couple closing comments I, I want to just hit with you. You mentioned, so you mentioned right at the top of this, you know, like your bit, the, the toddler stage of your business journey, especially with river was through 2008. Um, you also made, made, made a comment about like innovation happening through downturns and, um, I don't, I, I try to avoid to be too like clickbaity with content. I also am very aware that really no one, even the world's best economists know what's going to happen. So I'm not projecting, I'm not asking you, Hey man, what do you do in the next six months when everything goes to crap? Because we don't know exactly what is going to happen. But if there was a scenario where a market contracted and it just was more challenging, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs around navigating a changing market, having been through one yourself? Well, first thing is, is get excited because there's about to be a whole lot of innovation and maybe that's going to be from you. For you to be forced to, to, to innovate is what's going to happen from a sales perspective. And so I'd say start thinking like that. No, now is the time to plant the seeds. Don't wait for the storm before, you know, or for the, for the famine to, you know, to start planting the seed, you want to start doing it now. It's, uh, you know, and for the future reference, it's during times of prosperity where, where you plant the seeds. And then once the, the famine comes, now you can really separate yourself from the competition. I would also say, just got to get back to obsessing over learning your personal development, work on your sales skills, um, do role play trainings all the time with your team. If you're not doing that, if you're not doing role play trainings once a week with your sales team, you're missing out. Where do you think the current, the average, the archetypal sales team or salesperson for a contractor home service company, where are they at after two years of the COVID boom? Fat and happy syndrome, order takers. I mean, at least 90 I'm not saying that nobody was working but you didn't it there's the people that got in this game post 2020 they have no concept of what it's like to be in a dog fight and what it's like to really sell I'm the national sales manager uh or trainer excuse me for uh my franchise of of uh sales people uh that do uh swimming pools and I can tell you that you know for months now we've been talking about it's going to be a dog fight the dog fight's beginning and so you got to do whatever it takes to up your game. And a lot of people got to sharpen the saw up because it got pretty dull during COVID. Where can people find out more about your work, Marcus? Where where would you have our audience connect with you? I think we'll link to the book as well, but maybe just le leave a, a trail to follow you behind. Definitely LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to like, that is where all my best stuff lives. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Uh, so you can find me there. Obviously, get the book they asked you to enter, and you can reach out to me personally, Marcus at MarcusSheridan.com. Okay, amazing. I really appreciate your time today, Marcus. Uh, love the book. Love your story. We'll be in touch in the future because we, Breakthrough Academy, needs to implement a ton of this stuff. So um, thanks for being here today, and we'll see you next time. My pleasure, Beth. See ya. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.